Hey everybody! Today we're going to talk about Euphoria, Building a Better Dystopia. This came out a couple weeks back from Stonemaier Games. This is their second project behind Viticulture. And this one plays, it says two to six players. My experience maybe three to five. And it plays in just about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, it is a fabulous little worker placement game that uses dice as your workers and has this really nice dystopian theme. So everything's about keeping your workers dumb and happy and not letting them get too far and just saying yes and eating the Soma. <laughs> so it's really neat. We're going to set it up, get you through the rules, and then we'll meet back here to do just a smidge on like a what I thought kind of review afterward. All right, welcome to the world of Euphoria. We've actually already set up the board for you, so you place the board out. You're going to put resources around the board, usually near wherever you're going to gain them. So we have water, electricity, bliss, and oranges as your commodities. Then you have brick, stone, and gold as your resources. Next, you're going to put the tunnelers, these little tunnel meeples, um, at the beginning of each of the three tunnels. So there's one here for the Euphorians, one here for the Wastelanders, and one here for the Subterrans. And then one of these markers at the beginning of each allegiance track. So you're going to be moving these up, trying to earn victory points with them, and there's one for each of the four factions on the board. The last part of setup, I mean, other than kind of covering up the spaces, so number of players tells you how many spaces in each of these markets are available, so we're setting up a three-player game, so only three of them are available. But the last main board setup are these marketplace. Um, this time we've just shuffled, shuffled the deck up and drawn six. Um, as you get better at the game, you're going to try and draft those to make a little more informed decisions, because sometimes their abilities can be better or worse. Then, each player is going to draw four cards out of the recruit deck. So you're going to kind of give out four to each player, and they're going to take a look at the ability and weigh that against what faction they are, choosing one to be face up for the rest of the game and one to be hidden until it can be revealed through gameplay. Whichever one you choose to be face up, you're going to start gaining benefits from as you develop the board. So if we've developed some allegiance into a faction and I have that faction face up, I get benefits. So you're really going to want to weigh which ones you choose to have face up with what benefits you might get in the game. And there are, there are pros and cons to all of these. And so between the four, you'll choose two of them, decide which one is face up, which one is face down, and discard the other two. Later in the gameplay, there's actually a way of getting a third recruit and having that one affect you as well, but we'll get there soon. Each player is then outfitted with one of these. Uh, this serves two purposes. It has the list of commodities, resources, allegiance points, and miscellaneous down at the bottom. And on the other side, it has a moral dilemma. I'm hoping you can see that. So once per game, instead of taking your regular action, which we'll get to a little later, you can, oh, <laughs> right side up, um, you can choose a moral dilemma of kind of leaning into the dystopia or fighting against it. So this one is help a friend escape or turn in a friend. And it'll list a uh, card you need to turn in or just two of any card and two abilities. These are super important. They can sway a game a lot. Um, players are then outfitted with one of these. These are unnecessary and fabulous. Oh my gosh, I wish a lot of games would consider this where this is a, just a multiplier board so it says times one times two times three. As I gain resources in this game, I got one water. I get two water. I get three water. That way I don't have to have a pile of all of these little bits. I can just use place like placeholders as I gain more. I could just add a second placeholder. And that way I don't have to have these piles everywhere and just getting everything messed up. Um, I will then get 10 of these authority tokens. These are your victory points. 
Uh, we are looking at, this is the Kickstarter version, so that's why the gold is so shiny. And the authority tokens are actually wooden with the Kickstarter version. But the real version still looks very nice. I think I'm just a little spoiled because I've had these. Um, you get 10 of these authority tokens. This is your in-game scoring. The second that the tenth one is placed, you've won the game. So this is super important. It plays out a little like Alien Frontiers, in which the the game is just over at one point. There's no, there's very few times where you're gonna have tie breaks. And then each player will start with two workers. Workers are your dice. You can earn more, and you can lose them during the game. Uh, their values, you'll roll. And you'll have uh, in front of you as open information. So the the higher numbers in this game are generally worse, but they'll give you more effects. So next we're going to kind of zoom in on the board and we'll start talking about the individual effects of all the actions you can take. Okay, so we've got our board set up. We've got our three players. Each player is going to roll their dice for the first round to see who goes first. Highest dice will... Well, hi, sum of dice will go first, and we'll roll purple. And purple has ended up with a pair of threes, making them the highest roll. So, on the board, you have a few different types of actions. On your turn, you can take one of them. You can either add a die to the board, or you can remove any or all workers from the board. Both of those have costs, but that's just your basic idea. It's a little like Silk in the Mind calendar game, where you will have to just do one thing or another, and there's very few ways of getting multiple actions in the game. So what you're going to do, you're going to be looking at the generator, the farm, and the aquifer first. So these are some of the few places in the game that actually care about what uh, the die roll was the pips on that die roll. So when you add a die to one of these spaces, uh, and I'm sorry, there's also a cloud mine up at the top. Wherever the sum total of all pips in that space are will determine how much you get from it. So from one to four value here, you're going to gain one resource. So I'd gain a water from the aquifer. And I also push along the allegiance track for that faction. So anytime you see that little symbol, you're going to push the allegiance track along. Now, once we've hit the first section here of the aquifer, uh, one of the bonuses is unlocked. So what this means to us is that any player, and right now it's our purple player, who has the faction that has been unlocked, can now reap some benefit for how far the allegiance has been pushed forward. So for the first section, any time a player of the subterrans goes to the aquifer, they're going to get one extra water no matter wh what the value is there. Um, it's the same with the generator, the cloud mine, and the farm. So once you have some allegiance in there, you're automatically going to get extra stuff whenever you visit their, their uh, manufacturing. Um, so let's say the green player has now gone, they take their water, they got an allegiance, and they bumped up the allegiance track. Now it is White's turn. White is a Euphorian, um, so they're probably going to want to work on the Euphorian uh, generator. So the first thing they're going to do is place here, gain a lightning bolt, and push the Euphorian track up. So that on future turns, anytime they take that action, they're going to get some extra electricity. So now we can find out how this works with multiple people on the same track. Um, the purple player is going to place into the aquifer. They have a sum total of five here. So all the dice represented here equal five. So that's the second part. This will make where the purple player gets one water and loses one knowledge. The knowledge track is up at the top. And because they're subterranean, they're also going to gain an extra water. So they're going to gain two, and it will go on the two space of their card. I don't know if you can see that. Um, they're going to gain two water, and that's going to help them in one of the future actions they take. So, after this, the next type of action you can take is a dotted outline with an arrow. And there are tunnels for this. There are markets up at the top, artifact markets, 
And there are the worker activation tank also works with a dotted line and an arrow. What that means, so it's a green player's turn, is that they can place into a space with the, the dotted outline, pay the payment, whatever is darker here, and gain a benefit. So the tunnels, you pay one water, move the tunneler forward, and now you can either take a stone or an artifact card. The artifact deck looks like this, and it has about six different artifacts you can pick up. There's a teddy bear, there's some glasses, there's a book, there is an ancient copy of Viticulture. Yes, my group was very amused to find that out. <laughs> and there's a baseball bat. I'm sure there's something I'm missing. So if you go onto a tunnel, you can draw one of these artifact cards into your hand. And now what becomes relevant with this is the morale track up at the top. The track goes from 1 to 6 and determines your maximum hand size. So if you ever have more cards in your hand, artifact cards, then you have morale up at the top of the track. You actually have to discard down. And these are going to help pay for mostly for victory points, but also for a few other things. Um, and now the other type of repeatable action you have here are the worker activation tanks. So later in the game, when you have multiple amounts of electricity or water, you can place a die here. If it's electricity, you'll lose two knowledge. If it's water, you'll gain two morale. And then you activate a new worker, so you immediately take a new die, roll it, and it's available to be played the next round. Um, then, on another turn, if someone wants to take the action you took, because there's an arrow there, they can bump your worker out, give white back their worker, which they immediately re-roll, and they can take that action. So a lot of the actions in this game are non-rivalrous. The markets here that you see are, are just a cumulative sum. The ones with arrows can be pushed out by other players, including the tunnels. And then you come to the third type of action. These are constructed markets. So depending on the number of players, so in a three-player game, we're going to need two dice to construct a market. You can place a die here, paying the cost and resources down below. So there's gold, stone, and brick. Um, there's always going to be two types of resources on any given market. So if I play a die there, I must have a gold and play it. And then, if another player should come about, or if I on my next turn have another gold, I can complete the construction of this market. When you have a larger game, you're going to need more dice here. So in a four-player game, you're going to need three dice here, and in a five-player game, you're going to need all four spaces filled in order to construct this market. Now, these are super powerful. Um, when the construction is met, immediately flip over the market, place it to the left of where it was sitting before, which reveals a new action. All of the players that help construct it will take their dice back and re-roll them. And each player that can help construct the market will get a authority token on that market, which is super important. This is one of your 10 victory points. So each player would choose to place one authority token there. Even if you had multiple workers to help construct it, you still only get one authority token. Now, here comes the scuttle, like, just, this is the least fun part about this, is that if you didn't help construct the market, you fall into the penalty here at the bottom. So this is the stadium of guaranteed home runs. Um, for every time you roll a five, lose a commodity or resource. This happens to anyone that does not have a star on this market. Now, there are ways of gaining stars onto these markets, but that can be a huge blow once you start having multiple markets not built on. You really start getting hampered in the game. So you have to kind of make deals with people in the game to not be locked out of all the different markets as they come up. Now, there are a couple of different ways of getting stars out in the game. That's one of the really good ones. The other one is um, shown here, these artifact markets. So a die can be placed into an artifact market, and the payment here asks for three cards. 
You can pay three cards from your hand, assuming your morale is high enough for that, or two of any matching artifacts. So if I had two baseball bats, I could pay for that instead of the three cards it's asking for. And what these do is they give you an authority token in that market and also raise the allegiance of whichever space I'm in. So this is the Wastelanders. There's one for each of the factions. So there's one for the Icrites up top, one for the Euphorians, and one for the Subterrans. Now, when I get that authority token, if I had placed it, let's say Green had placed that over here, I could take that authority token and I could place it either on a marketplace in that section I hadn't joined previously, or I can place it into one of the available spots on the artifacts territory here. So there's three available because we're a three-player game, but most likely I'm going to place it onto a marketplace so that I can get rid of that penalty that's been hurting me. I don't want to have to keep paying things when I roll fives. Now we come to the next type of action you can take on a turn is if you have zero dice, or even if you do have dice, you can take an action to gather your workers back to your pool. And there's one of two ways to do that, and it's kind of printed on the board over here. You can pay an orange or a bliss and take your workers back and gain two morale for it. Or you can pay one morale to take your workers back. Um, now, if you gain morale, you can take any or all of your workers and re-roll them and then gain your two morale. Or, if you're at one and you have no risk of losing any morale, you're fine. Um, so you can just take your workers back and have zero penalty. So when you come back, you re-roll them. And this is where your knowledge comes into hand. So we've rolled a seven. We check the sum of any face-up die at any given time and add it to our knowledge score. So right now we're at a 10. If that number is ever 16, we will lose one worker. You'll lose your greatest worker. So if I had rolled really high and I had a 6 here, I would lose one of my two workers and it would run back until I could buy it back from the market. Uh, the, the tank, sorry. Uh, then we get into some of the finer points of the game. So there's two things we really haven't hit on yet. We haven't hit on the Ikerites, and we haven't hit on the other bonuses for Allegiance and how to reveal hidden recruits. So first and foremost, the Ikerites. This is a very deceptive track. The Ikerites don't have the normal tunneling. They don't have a resource. They, they try really hard, but they don't always get out into the markets. So you have to play an Ikerite a little differently. Um, they have their regular artifact market, so you pay your cards, you get the star, you get the Ikerite bonus. You also have these three abilities, which are pretty unique. So Ikerites can pay three resources to get a star and an allegiance. They can pay a bliss and one of any other commodity to get two cards and a, an allegiance. And they can also pay a commodity... Uh, a bliss and a, another commodity to get an Icarite bump and two resources. So they really have a nice little engine going that's very self-contained. Most other players, if they have recruits down here, are going to have to be doing a lot of different things and moving things around. And the Icarites very much just want to spam their own cloud mines and sky lounges and all kinds of fun things to bump themselves up, getting stuff getting resources, trying to spam out on everyone else's victory points because they're not going to care about the tunnels. A lot of, just a quick strategy tip, if you choose a really good Ikerite bonus power, you may consider choosing an Ikerite as your hidden recruit as well. And that is the next thing we're going to talk about, which is allegiance bonuses. So the first thing we hit on was that once you are in the first section, sorry, I'm in the light, once you're in the first section of Allegiance Tracks, you get an extra commodity every time you take that action. So if you take an Aquifer, you get an extra water. If you take a Cloud Mine Auction, you get an extra Bliss. The next section of this, for the most part, for the Tunnelers, will make the or an and. So when you're tunneling, normally you would pay your resource, and you'd either get a stone or a card. But if you have a recruit of the faction and your allegiance is bumped up enough, 
you actually get a stone and a heart. So that is a very helpful tool. And these are cumulative. You don't lose your first ability because you unlock the second one. Uh, all three of the tunnelers have that same ability to, it's able to be unlocked. So as long as you have recruited that faction, that's going to happen for you. The Ikeites are a little bit different. And their allegiance track ability is not as good. But it can be really fun. Um, once they've hit into this second section and they've unlocked all these bonuses. The Ikerites, every time they place a star in their upper market, they can draw a card. And that is incredibly powerful, especially in a six-player game where there might be six spaces on that star available, but in the three-player, it's not quite as good. And then we come to the reveal. Once a pawn has slipped into this fourth, or the third spot here, Anyone with a hidden recruit of that faction, let's say our white player here, would have to reveal their recruit. What happens when they reveal is that they automatically start getting whatever benefit is written on that card. So this one says, when you pay Bliss to retrieve workers, you can lose knowledge instead of gaining morale. That can be very handy so you don't lose extra workers all the time. And the final spot on the allegiance track is a star. It's down here at the end. When the allegiance reaches this mark, anyone with a recruit face up of that faction, which should be all their all the recruits possible, get to place an authority token on any of the recruits of that faction. So our white player would be able to place one on their newly revealed recruit, and the green player who's been Icarate all along also gets to place an authority token. Now the game goes along until someone reaches their tenth authority token. At that time, the game is finished, and they have won. During the game, though, there is plenty of room in this game for deal-making, trading resources, and trying to make up for the fact that the recruits and the factions are asymmetrical. So if Joe and I start out as both Euphorians, and little Timmy over there is just a wastelander, it's going to be much harder for Timmy to stay in the game with us because we were working toward the same goals to get stars on these guys. Um, we have found that the trading and kind of table talk helps to balance, balance that out a little bit. Uh, one last rule I didn't really hit on very well was that once you've completed a market and you can see it here, you place it to the left, and that unlocks a new ability that will get you stars into the territory you're in. So this one is the Registry of Personal Secrets. You'd pay four bliss in an artifact card, move the subterrans up a level, and get a star. You can take an action even if you can't receive a full benefit, just to push the subterrans up, or if the subterrans are already full, just to get the star out. And the last part of this, so... The tunnelers are also able to reveal. It doesn't have to just be from the allegiance track. The tunnelers, once they reach this little slippy recruit card action, anyone with that allegiance can or must flip their recruits over. And once the tunneler gets to the end of this little tunnel, you would reveal an action that can be taken by any one of the faction that tunneled there. So this is one of the few things in the game that actually cares about who you are. Once you're a Wastelander, you'd be able to take this action and gain three electricity. This is only for Wastelanders. The tunnelers last all the way down through there. Uh, stay tuned for some of my thoughts, and we'll get back and we'll talk about what I thought. So now that we've talked about the game, how to play it, how to set it up, um, as far as gameplay goes, I feel like this is going to be able to take the place of something like uh, Alien Frontiers, which I love, but maybe have played enough games of in my life. Uh, it does have a new expansion coming out. I'm not talking smack about Alien Frontiers, but as far as lightweight, easy to get anyone into dice worker placement games go, this definitely lends to something very different. Um, the beauty of this game is in the asymmetrical factions, recruits, talking about things, making deals, constructing markets together, working above board, 
but also trying to win, which is something I particularly love about games. Uh, the Kickstarter version was also worth its weight in money and time spent. I'm very glad that I got to kickstart it. I am kind of sad that, especially ga game companies like Stonemeyer, who makes the Euphoria, they very much care about Kickstarter exclusives. They do not resell, they do not market their bits that were in the Kickstarter version and they only put them in their next Kickstarter. So all those beautiful little wooden authority tokens and the upgraded bits, the little pieces of brick and the gold that's all shiny, I, I really wish that was something that I could sell at my retail shop to customers who maybe didn't get in on the Kickstarter. Um, the last piece Ooh, I gotta show you, because um, they did alternative art on the back of the board. Wow, so big. And it's so pretty. It's so pretty. And it takes away some of that busy busyness from the front, and it just has this old school, lovely feel to it. Um, I quite like that, and I really wish that was something that my customers could then uh, turn around and buy. So what will probably happen is that the Kickstarter version, for those who maybe didn't love the game, will go up on eBay or the Board Game Geek marketplace and people can buy them there. Uh, I do think the game is a little limited in number of players. You really want four or five. You do not want two. Uh, and three feels a little lopsided if two people are working toward the same faction. Then the third man out, unless they're double, like, Icarite or something that kind of maintains its own self. Euphorians and Icarites do a little bit better, I feel, by themselves than a lot of the other factions. Um, that being said, I still love it. Uh, as far as gameplay goes, I, I love it, and it's making deals and moving pretty bits around the board. I wish they would just have put cubes as the allegiance trackers. They're these little parallelograms that don't stand up. Just just one cube. One corner that's not rounded or cut into. One one beautiful classic cube is all you need in the game. Um, the dice are mitigated and wonderful. So when you roll your dice, you're really almost always shooting for low dice, but your high dice can definitely be used to block out other people's options, and I do like that the bumpable actions, the things that you can place and other people can replace, um, the pips don't matter there, and I almost expected them to. I almost expected only larger, more intelligent dice to shove someone out of the way, but I am glad that they kept that a little more open, and I, I feel that that helps with the I can have anyone play this game with me vibe. So uh, if you see it on shelves, pick it up. And um, if you liked what you saw here, follow me on YouTube, follow me on Twitter, it's at MaggieBot, and we'll see you guys all soon. Bye.